Hello, I'm Morse Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor. Today's theme is going to be the use of the ferro cerium alloy in the issue of the big lighter flints. So when you scrape it, the heat evolves, is so intense that you can use it as a fire lighter. At any rate, uh, uh, my um, associate here, Kelly Harleton, he's been around for many years. Uh, he's focusing on kindlings and I am trying to impress people with my collection of the metal matches I like to call it. There are many different names. Some of the people in Alberta know these things as zerks because originally we didn't know what would be a, a decent name and the original big flints like this were made out of zirconium which being a uh, um, strategic material and uh, as a moderator in atomic reactors I think people uh, don't feel comfortable in letting normal people possess too much of this stuff because you might be uh, trying to make a, an atomic bomb. Anyway the, the uh, rods come in many sizes from many sources. I think uh, a lot of the rods are made in uh, China. So the Chinese version might uh, have to be used a little differently than, than uh, those that come from Germany or other parts of the world. We have the one form of rod. I'm particularly enamored of the issue that uh, your knife and your means to light fire are on the same package and your knife is modified on the corners here to be able to give a really good scrape and so you hold it firmly and then using the back you give it a few scrapes and eventually they catch on fire and uh, you can see that uh, the instantaneous flame that you get there is um, uh, so if you can light photocopy paper while it's laying flat on the table you must realize that there is some significant advantage to an igniter uh, uh, that operates that way as opposed to matches. Now some people in the learning process figured that if you associated a metal that ignites very uh, effectively which is magnesium. Magnesium is actually in some ways mm, better than aluminum. Aluminum is softer and uh, not as hard. Well if you take magnesium and scrape up a pile of scrapings and ignite the scrapings you're going to set almost everything on fire. So there we have that that issue. Well here someone goes a step further and for a military uh, uh, application they've got um, uh, a rod that is protected from the elements because the rod corrodes very readily. Uh, the, my early rod that I lost in the back of a truck, it just about dissolved on me, you might say. Uh, here they have a device that gives you a fire, doesn't uh, get affected by jungle conditions, and in the other you might have some special uh, material that you can ignite, but in this case it's actually for the amphetamines that the soldiers might carry so that when they need the amphetamines for that extra boost under severe duress. But if you have this, it's designed to be a Yarwa stick. That means that you can use it as a combat tool, a tool in combat. Uh, I actually have about a five page handout on how you use that in combat. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, it really appeals to me when you've got multi uses for the same thing. So this person has uh, chosen to make this out of magnesium and so uh, instead of just a bar. These people that make these, I don't know, uh, they thought that the uh, relationship of the lighter flint that's there and the amount of magnesium, they give you about four times as much and as a result you're carrying around this large bar and you wear out the, the sparker and you end up with an awful lot of the, of the magnesium left over. Uh, interesting idea. Uh, there's a deficiency in thinking here. Whoever manufactures should realize how undependable a keychain is. 
So we find a lot of these people, instead of using something more secure, they uh, allow a keychain, and the keychain can fail on you uh, very readily, as does the glue, where this little rod is, is glued onto there. And, and some of these uh, plastic ends on here, if you got it dangling off some kind of necklace, one day you uh, check your necklace and you find the rod is gone because the glue is given out. So you got to watch out for these sort of things. Now the, uh, the industry here is confronted with the um, rod, but the rod doesn't work very well if you haven't a decent means to scrape it. And they really fail on the issue of providing a really good scraper. Well, I prefer to uh, make sure that the corners of my knife are very sharp so that when I, I give it a scrape that we get stuff that... Uh, the test for the scraping notion. Your scraper should allow your rod to uh, scrape off enough that it ends up on the ground and it's still sparking. That's the acid test for how good your scraping thing is. So all these hacksaw blades and these little things here and <laughs> none of them really, uh, they're, they're the, oh, that side is not too bad. Um, so you, you uh, I often take a, a can opener and use it by uh, filing an edge. And then I've got a can opener in, 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 to go with the, with the, um, uh, you know, multi-use concept, might say. Well, we have the early ones, which were the huge lighter flints, which I understand were used in, uh, in uh, the big lighters that ignited the diesel fuel on seagoing tankers. And they stopped manufacturing that because they converted to electronic. There's rods that are especially big. Notice this device here, <coughs> where the people really go to a lot of trouble to produce uh, uh, the thing, but uh, the flaw here is they make it four or five times as big as it need me. I'd prefer to carry a rod like this than all of this paraphernalia where they got a container for your kindling and, and so on. Now when we mention kindlings, you saw this paper uh, ignite because the, the spark is so, so uh, heavy. Here I got a pile of this magnesium and it really goes up. It might even uh, uh, create a, a hazard of some sort. <laughs> when the magnesium ignites, you can see you've got that. But that's about 10,000% overkill. <laughs> yeah. I would see people, you know, scrape up the magnesium and light stuff. And, and I, I realized after a while, I can light the stuff without the magnesium. But of course, the magnesium is kind of fun to play with. But the, but the, uh, the, the situation there is that... Uh, uh, something uh, you're you're putting in an extra uh, cost, an extra encumbrance, and whatever. Um, there are many different. The, the 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 this size here gets about as small and compact. Probably the little doohinky here can be cut off, and you know there are a lot of people they go backpacking and they even cut the handles on their toothpaste into half length so they don't have to carry, they cut the handles in half on their spoons so they don't have to carry that extra burden. Uh, for a while, the only thing that was available was uh, these little, little type, uh, little uh, flints, uh, probably from some kind of lighter. And so there was a fellow that would glue them onto a stick and uh, people would learn to light fire by using the, and this is fairly old, so as a result it softened. So I had to take a few scrapes to get past the, the whatever. Well, you realize with such a short flint that when you uh, uh, take the rod and in your early learning days you take the full scrape. Then as time goes on you get skilled, you take the half scrape. And then as time goes on you discover when you got a stub that's one quarter of the length. Oh, I've lit. Look at that. I inadvertently lit. I wasn't in intent intending to let that. That was a piece of wax paper uh, that caught on fire on its own. But anyway, full stroke and later half stroke and then a quarter stroke and you discover that you can uh, pretty well um, um, uh, succeed in, in using, making this last four times as long because you uh, learn that it takes such a short stroke, which also gives you the clue that when you find a, a regular Bic lighter or a lighter and it uh, has no more fuel, there's a little bit of a sparky 
thing left that you can maybe light fire with that surprisingly easily if you know how. But uh, there's no hope in, in Hades that you can work that out for yourself in the survival episode. You've got to play around with these things uh, while you're training and uh, refine all these techniques because when the survival episode occurs, uh, you don't have the mental and experimental resources to be able to work these things out. Now the rod produces this very, very hot spark, which can catch carpeting on fire from a standing position. And when you're caught out there, you can probably manage with just these very powerful, to me this puts you into the space age. It's um, the most indestructible, dependable, compact way to carry fire if you know how to use it. And the problem that when you encounter some kind of a disaster, if you've got the time, you can find the materials in the forest. It's been raining for three, four days. You can still find the materials and proceed to light a fire, but you'll be lighting that fire a half an hour or hour later, perhaps. So you always carry the means to get your first fire going, which means that you've got the rod, but you've also got some kind of material that will help you light the fire in the next few minutes rather than working at finding the fine kindling that would work. And my favorite is wax paper, because wax paper is waterproof and very combustible. And you might even see that a candle, if you have it, here's a multiple use item. The uh, candle has got uh, uh, repellent uh, in it so that when you light the candle, it drives away the mosquitoes because it has oil of citronella in it. But you know you're getting good when you can use the rod and you can light the candle directly. But that takes a lot of practice. And it's people who are, are selling these rods in trade shows that can put on those demonstrations. But the wax paper catches even more readily than the typing paper. Now after that, uh, Kelly will be covering all kinds of, uh, of uh, kindlings. Because you want to, people say, how come you want to know so many cures for diarrhea? Or, how come you're going to want to know so many different kindlings? Well, if you only know one cure, you likely might not find it when you need it. So you've got to have uh, the opportunity to be able to evaluate everything, every diarrhea cure, so that when you need it, you just take 10 steps and there it is. Instead of saying, oh, I saw this somewhere, we have to go there and let's spend the next few hours getting the diarrhea cure. <laughs> the one that's underfoot is the one <coughs> you want. So with the kindlings, uh, you have a lot of choices. And of course the physics and chemistry involved in the, you know, the physics and chemistry of combustion comes into play uh, with regard to that. Uh, probably related to your wax paper. Uh, the, the thickest wax paper I find, that I always save it, my wife uh, is not allowed to throw out the wax paper from the Jello packages. For some reason they use an unusually heavy wax paper there. Another one that I've seen other people use a great deal, it's cotton saturated in uh, uh, you know, Vicks Vapor Rub. I prefer Vicks Vapor Rub on account that it's also available for medicinal applications. And if I really need to badly, I can use it to light a fire. Then there is a material that's harvested from the um, blisters of the balsam fir. It's a, a material that has to be stored in a glass bottle. When you have a burn, you pour it on that burn uh, and, uh, and the pain is almost instantly gone and it's such an effective means to keep infection and everything down. This is almost a magical material. This is probably worth a five pound first aid kit because nothing will form pus under it. And the pain of a burn, it's a common thing to be a little forgetful and pick up a pot. You don't realize it and the bale hangs over on the side and you pick it up and you burn yourself across the fingers. That's uh, very distracting and so on. You put that stuff on and then by the time you count 30, the pain is gone and, uh, and nothing will get infected. So, so you use it from many applications where you don't want uh, uh, infection to set in. Uh, if you use this material, you can saturate something with it and it becomes very combustible. 
and uh, in some cases the hardened version of uh, this material is um, one of the, the best uh, fire lighting uh, me when people say what is what it, what is one of the the um, um, what do you call it best things you could ever possibly teach anybody on how to light fire it's the use of the the uh, resin saturated bark here I've ignited it uh, earlier uh, that uh, uh, in the case of getting a fire going when things are are uh, touch and go then you don't even think of starting a fire till you've got a goodly amount of that stuff and you'll always light a fire without wasting matches. And here we have all kinds of matches. I like to talk about matches. Uh, there's red-headed matches, green-headed matches, blue-headed matches. <laughs> the colors might signify something. Uh, who knows? And uh, uh, we, ta we talk about uh, uh, lighting the uh, uh, here in the open that once you get the resin saturated material well if you sa if you take your uh, some material like grass or something and put some of that liquid stuff on this stuff here you'll get it to catch fire more readily here you can see a, a very uh, uh, black suited fire it doesn't um, blow out too readily but the wind will blow it out now if you there's dripping that can occur there if you drip that on your skin that injury is horrible it's an injury caused by something that is medicinally used to deal with that injury but if you drip that on your skin you might find that this might not stop the pain so do be careful but uh, we've got this this circumstance there's a use for that soot that you can maybe condense that soot and do things with it. But I would say that I don't know anything that is as effective in lighting a fire under duress. If it's been raining for a week and I want to not waste a match, I go for this stuff. And also, if I want to make you talk, when I drip this on your forehead, you're going to talk. <sighs> anyway, this uh, now to touch it when it's molten, boy, that's a bad injury. <clears throat> So, there are many things that participate in fire lighting. Um, we have, uh, uh, oh, lighters, lighter flints. So here, I bought this not that long ago, probably two years ago, and it was just pointed out to me that there is a lighter, like one of these, that fuels this device. And just sitting there, the liquid fuel has disappeared. <laughs> Keep that in mind when you pack these things in your kit. That uh, that the, the 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 material, I mean the the plastic, that a lot of that plastic, that things are made out of modern plastics. Uh, the spacesuits that they use to walk on the moon, all the tubing and all that modern stuff is turned to liquid. So as a result, you've got to be suspicious of plastic things and how they retain uh, volatile materials and so on and so on. A lot of people are very big on Bix as a means of fire lighting. Nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Uh, you should uh, be knowledgeable on all these things, whether it's mattress and all their different sizes and, and so on. But the, the issue here is that uh, you realize that uh, a person like myself who spent 40 years at this, you discover all kinds of things you should be sort of warned about. So one thing, for example, when it's really cold, there's no pressure. The cold has reduced the, the pressure of the fuel that you've got to put it in your armpit until it's thoroughly warm and then before it gets a chance to cool, you light your fire. The other thing you discover that on some circumstances, you take something like this and you travel on an airplane and the people there don't protect they, they got laws against you carrying stuff like this because it's so explosive I and mean, you're a welder and you happen to run your cutting torch or something across this you have an instantaneous uh, uh, uh disastrous situation happen and the other thing you find that if you're in a in a a, a sandy environment sort of like a desert that little valve in there 
will will uh, pick up grit and uh, in a very short while you don't have any fuel inside there but remember that that little spark that you got in there if you can disassemble and and get at that flint you might be able to use it to light fire substituting this for the rock and the carbon steel because you got a source of tiny little sparks that will transfer to uh, um, um, uh, you know, larger kindling. So this is a huge, huge lighter flint. That's the essential. That's the the um, uh, uh, space age material that allows you to do a lot. It's all the other stuff around it. Well, you can get by without it, like the rest of the big lighter. When you get rods like this, they're quite handy in bar fights too, because when you have that in your hand, as you hit somebody on the jaw. Very often makes a big difference. They figure you're, 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 you're pretty astounding. We have many fungi that uh, participate in, in traditional kindlings and tinders and, and carrying fire and creating smoke that's either used to drive away insects or to make you feel better. You've got, uh, oh, these are other odds and ends. Some people are really interesting in that they take if, um, they take um, and break down a, a, li a lighter to its more fundamental forms and then they include that in your survival kit as a means to light fire. Well, either include a lighter or whatever, not parts of a lighter. So they've got this thing that throws the little sparks uh, onto some kind of uh, a material. Uh, you know, they get all tied up in manufacturing something that... Uh, um, you know, it's sort of like not adhering to to logic or sense. In the making of tinder, this is in the field of striking a hard rock. We're digressing a bit there. Here is an issue of if you take something like a hacksaw blade and you take something hard, like a rock usually, it's hard enough. You might not realize there are soft rocks and hard rocks. And if you've got a rock that's hard enough, a spark will catch on a material called tinder. Now, a lot of writers, I even catch people writing a book that I, 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 I'm reading the book and then I turn to the front and say, when was this published? And it says, 19, uh, 20, 2010. And the person is uh, calling kindling tinder and tinder kindling. <laughs> There's Tinder is reserved for very special material. Here on the table, uh, I've got this fungus. That's called a true tinder fungus. Then another one called a false tinder fungus. And then I have material that has been charred. And what we have here is uh, is a two cans loosely fitted together because we have read the uh, the uh, books on chemistry on the physics and chemistry of combustion and everything and we have packed this with a material now Kelly is going to talk about a lot of kindlings that will be ignited by this this uh, rod these rods well this is the material that's ignited by a tiny spark that comes off of a rock that's hard enough that's taking fine bits of metal off of this and this is just a broken hacksaw blade that uh, makes an excellent spark that uh, you light fire with. This is the traditional flint and steel method of fire which is probably mastering the flint and steel. It's not a big deal. Even I found grade fours in the school system will get skilled at lighting fire this way by knocking a spark into a, a piece of tinder. So a tiny spark lands on this and it begins to glow. That's tinder. If you take this big spark and you make something burn, uh, you can't call that stuff. That stuff won't ever ignite from the tiny spark off a of hard rock. This humongous spark here that's 3000 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever it is, it ignites almost anything on fire, you might say. So be careful that when you say flint and steel, a lot of people, this, is, is the flint from flint and they figure it's, that's flint and steel. No, this is uh, an exotic alloy 
that is particularly suited to creating such a hot spark when you scrape a piece off of it. And, and, and the scraping action um, um, ignites the material. So kindling can be defined as something that when you hold a flame on it and you say one, two, three, four, five, it better be burning. If it's not burning, it, it shouldn't be called kindling. Now the next step would be fine fuel that the kidney, kindling ignites and fine fuel probably from match thick to pencil thick and then comes regular medium fuel and on and on. We have, we have to define these things so that uh, uh, the student knows what you're talking about when you're using matches. Now here's a, an adjunct. This is a splint, splint dipped in molten sulfur. If I take this and I strike a spark on here, the tiniest little spark, I touch that sulfur stick to it, and that tiny little bit of spark ignites this and that acts like a match. Except a regular match, which has, of all I know, hundreds of chemicals to formulate the match head. This is just sulfur. And when it, it catches on fire very readily, and it tends not to blow out very easily, but it also is pretty sharp if you happen to get it too close to your nose. And so when you make the tiny little spark using a fire piston, so here you got compression when you take 20 volumes of air and compress it down to one volume. The heat generated by doing that is enough to ignite a tinder, not a kindling. In here you put uh, the charred material, or you put the, the um, uh, true tinder fungus is my favorite. Were you going to do any of that now? Well, here is the true tinder fungus, which is exquisitely suited for this purpose. And you take a little bit of it and you put it into this little cup. And generally from the, the uh, issue, and I haven't done this in a long time, so it's probably going to be a bit of a flub. Now, a lot of the problem is that you have to have a very good seal and you've got to... Um, um, Oil the, the piston, you might say. Well, you take dog fat, works really good. If you, the, whatever you use, for the, you can actually use water, because some of them make these fire pistons and you're using water instead of this oil. And uh, in the issue of what works, dog fat and badger fat apparently uh, is highly suitable, because you know you can't just add any old oil to your motorcycle gas without it gumming up your spark plug. <laughs> so commercially, and you're into doing this, this is the 100 to 1 synthetic two-cycle oil for <laughs> running. <laughs> and this was pointed out to me by someone uh, at one of the trade shows, and I've used it, and it works like a charm. So here, by compressing it, you, uh, you uh, find that if you're in practice and everything has been worked up, uh, the compression when Rudy Diesel, well not today, I guess this is all dried out and, and whatever, but Rudy Diesel when he saw that he said, holy mackerel, I don't need spark plugs. I can create a, uh, an engine that runs on, uh, that, that gets its ignition from compression. You might say, well that's a pretty tiny spark. When that spark is transferred to the end of this stick it catches very readily and away you go, and you've got now open flame where you've got, um, you know, the kettle of fish that, um, that you open there, that you get there, allows you to, to uh, go about lighting fire. And you got, um, well, they're flint and steel while we're talking about it. There are some people that make these, they get the Altoids, uh, a friend of mine, and Altoids, then he chars it to make, look, make it look rustic and realistic. And in here he's got a piece of hacksaw blade glued onto a little piece of wood. And then he has a flake, <coughs> uh, a flake of, um, of uh, uh, you know, well, he looks like he's got the mushroom, the false tinder fungus, and then rolls of charred material and, and whatever. You might say that that's the tinderbox that maybe you want to make sure that it's waterproof. 
but you don't make your tinder using this on account that <coughs> you'll ruin your container. You will see these containers with a with a uh, uh, crude magnifier on there, which you can't really use much for magnifying, but you can sure use the sun to light the tinder. And and uh, and if you fill that full of material to be carbonized and put on the fire, that little magnifier there ain't going to work for you very long. Anyway. Try to keep things in order. Uh, candles as a source of light, as a means to uh, um, get a flame, and then eventually the flame dries out your kindling to the point where it ignites. So I say that there is a lot of merit. Uh, I love putting together these kits like this where uh, on the outside, I put various strings that I'll like to use sooner or later. Some from uh, enough to for a bow drill cord and for tying and lashing and synthetic sinew and what have you. Then inside you've got, here you can get matches this big. And it's a Swedish match. And you get about 10 of them in a package and you strike it and that probably burns for 10 minutes. So it's like a candle, uh, it, it provides so much heat for ignition. Then you've got paper matches. Well, people who are training might find that these are useful, but you also find very often that people who put survival kits together, they choose to uh, include matches of this nature in their kit for your ignition purposes. Well, this big kitchen match that comes out of the big box, that's actually one BTU, probably. One British thermal unit, well, heat one pound of water one degree, well, one BTU. Then you end up getting into uh, uh, the little boxes of matches. Well, there's one there. That's probably about a quarter BTU. It stands to reason that if you hold the two matches side by side, that one is, is a lot smaller than the other. Actually, three of these are equal to one of those. And then you take your paper matches. Well, this would be grade three. This would be grade six. This would be grade nine. And then you take the match and split it in half and that's grade 12. Now you're splitting the match. Never, never pack paper matches as your backup, but you're splitting it to prove to yourself you're capable of lighting a fire under most circumstances with that split because that split match once I get a, the means to handle it and get it going and I can transfer that flame because once I light that split paper match, it's going to last this long. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> so that means that the material you transfer the flame to better be accepting of that so that when you hold that split paper match on that kindling and you say one, two, three, four, five, it's burning because you've transferred that flame. This is to prove your training, not to challenge yourself in a survival situation. If you do pack these matches in your survival kit, pack enough so you can use the whole package. <laughs> that is, you take the one match and you also find you've got to fan these matches out because if you don't, it doesn't want to work and then ignite the whole package and then you'll get somewhere because I find working with kids, <laughs> that's one way to trying to teach them how to use fire. So I, I find that I, Now the other thing about paper matches is that they age. So if you've kept your paper matches for a long, now if I hadn't fanned those out, that would have flared up like that and then it, it uh, the flame is almost invisible. But because they're fanned, fanned out, then uh, this will persist and not blow out too readily. Oh, this happened to me once in my career where the kids used up all my wooden matches and all I had left was paper matches. So I gave them each and then I said, hey, we got, we've used, uh, wa wasted too much time. <laughs> I guess they've been drizzling and, uh, you know, kids, 12-year-olds, uh, and, and when I showed them this, they were so pleased that they were able to get their fire going. But that was both the only way they could do it by, by using that approach. So in an emergency, paper matches have their, their, uh, 
This is the concept that I learned from watching that movie, The Flight of the Phoenix. You know, the old, old uh, bush pilot and the old and the young the model aircraft designer and how the guy's going to start the engines and he says, "I got to blow every cylinder." And then the last shot is to start the engine. Oh no, no, no! You better try. You better start trying. You can't do that. You're, gonna, you're probably not going to be able to start the engine. But the old pilot knew that he had to clear all the pistons in that last shot because he wasn't going to get anywhere if he's going to try to prematurely fire the engines. You know, when you're those airplanes, I don't understand what the thing is, but they were started by these shotgun shell-like things that they put in and they fired off. Well, here it is. Light the whole package and you're going to succeed. Try to light it one by one by one. You won't have a fire. You've used up all your matches. Anyway. The candles, uh, candles here, uh, here's one at Ikea, they sell candles made out of stearine, stearine, they're twice as expensive. This candle burns for eight hours, very appropriate. The, uh, a candle and a human produce, generates the same amount of warmth inside of a super shelter, 300 BTUs per hour. And if you've got two buddies sharing your shelter, the three of you, can often bring the temperature up and uh, under certain circumstances, not always, when it gets bitter cold, it's not gonna work, but there are certain circumstances where just the fact that you've built a super shelter and you're sleeping in your clothes because you're sharing it with two buddies. But if you don't have the buddies, you should have two candles because you light them and the heat. Uh, I've played around with this and it's remarkable what you can do if you're sleeping near the ceiling and you've properly built your bubble uh, that uh, that can make a huge difference because you didn't chose not to bring a sleeping bag and you've got uh, you're sleeping in your in your down jacket and and it's still a bit chilly but with the two candles going you find that it's warm enough to sleep at any rate there's a lot to be said all this stuff that's sitting on the table probably if you did uh, justice to all the knowledge that's sort of captured in these containers, you probably need a 400 page book. Oh, here's one. I always like to throw in something that might save your life. I don't know if these things are available so much. You know, this is like lawn darts. Somebody comes up with the idea of darts that you can throw in a big target and then, and then you accidentally have people catching the lawn dart in their skull. And they become very dangerous. Well, they come up with these heaters so you've got, uh, you've got these things that look like a large lighter. And this one here, you saturate lighter fluid or whatever. But there are some versions that use these sticks. And if you're using these to warm your sleeping bag because you hadn't studied how to bring enough bag to be comfortable without using stuff like this, these are probably good as hand warmers when you go skating and go walking and hiking. But if you're using them to warm your bag, the accumulation of the carbon monoxide and so on from these sort of things will le reach lethal proportions. This might be the charcoal burner. And you find they're nicely dressed and they, they're kind of insulated. You get this glowing, a stick glowing or two glowing. And the amount of warmth is, uh, is pretty, um, pretty significant. But using it out of context by heating a bag, perhaps putting it in the foot of your bag to warm your feet or whatever, and then you pull your head in and you're, it's bitter cold out and you're sort of hidden in and, and whatever, uh, you might find that that's not good. And you might die from that. Um, I've also heard that dry cleaning sleeping bags can also create something similar. The residue from the dry cleaning materials might uh, might uh, be lethal in, in certain context. At any rate, what have we learned here in the space age? Add this to your mylar reflective sheet, your paracord and this, those are the space age materials. Realize that the, the balsam fur the contents of the blisters is such a powerful medicinal uh, material that's sort of connected with fire because uh, uh, not only does that deal with a severe burn, but it also helps light a fire if you so need it. And if you have a knife setup system where your, your rod and your knife are in the same place, so you've got 
the two things that work together. You put that around your neck and uh, just make sure you're wearing enough clothes and you're likely going to do fairly well. Here you might have ditty bags made out of a waxed cloth. Maybe you should experiment. If you cut the cloth into strips, maybe you ignite the cloth and you light your fire using your ditty bag. And your ditty bag has got a thing to tie, but also you can put it on your belt when you're picking berries or you're carrying stuff uh, outside where you want to get your hands on it right away. Then there is these type of stoves. There's a complex device, less complex looking. The fellow that worked on these are Don Cavellis from Four Dog Stove. When I saw, you know, I knew him for quite a while before I actually saw him demonstrate the stove. He was putting on workshops. It's a Boy Scout uh, activity. He, his father really got into this. And then when Don started building stoves, he found he had a lot of leftover um, the scraps from uh, the, the titanium. This is made out of titanium. And uh, all kinds of things are brought in. And I had uh, devoted a lot of study to the issue of the physics and chemistry of combustion. And when I saw this on operation, I almost fainted when I saw what was going on in the issue of of uh, volatilization, um, uh, mixing of volatiles and uh, double burn and all these things. And I have yet to find any kind of device. There's one that uh, you light a little fire in there and electricity is generated. You can, you can uh, that's the latest thing uh, we've seen. And you can plug in your cell phone to recharge it. But also that little electrical thing runs a motor, a fan. He still beats uh, that device that complex device with this simple non-moving parts. You got uh, a double wall, then you got the thing that looks like a fan, but as the air is drawn under, there is a control of the amount of air that comes in there so that there is a, an attempt to adjust for the uh, mixture of volatiles plus the oxygen. So you get an optimal burn without, you know, you get too much fuel and too little oxygen, you get a problem. You get too much oxygen and not the right proportion of fuel and you get a problem. Well, you know, that's sitting on a waterproof thing. All that has been worked out. And whether it's stuff that goes in here or a container with, with liquid fuels or fats or oils, or uh, this burns all of those things proficiently. Here, using tin cans and all that to run workshops, just about as good. But a lot of people go for that because they figure titanium and it looks space age and whatever. Well, we went on this trip to to Tuktoyaktuk and this is what I brewed my porridge and my coffee with. And uh, it, it worked uh, marvelously. There is um, um, tablets that you use in certain types of stoves. And these uh, tablets are marvelous for packing in your survival kit to be able to light a fire under duress because you light the tablet and um, here you put tablets in there if you get but once you get it started then of course cones and um, uh, pruning shears go very well with uh, uh, this this type of container to keep the fuel. Well at any rate we have exhausted uh, some of the things that we have here in, in one session. Uh, I've probably said enough about igniters and we're going to transfer to Kelly and his kindlings. Thanks, sir. The, uh, an igniter without a decent kindling is a horse without a carriage or whatever. you gotta, you got to find that, uh, first of all, you've brought something very compact, very hot, very strong. Now you've got to interrelate with the environment and learn how to use what nature provides in order to get your fire going. Uh, there aren't very many people in the, in, the, in the bush that will light a f warming fire in 10, 15 minutes. Many of them light a fire and an hour and a half later it's getting warm enough in order to be able to you know, use a fire the way it's ne you need to use it in order to stay warm because the people just haven't been exposed to the 
technicality of, of knowing all that. But the first step is the kindling. Awesome. The, uh, Thanks, so, Morris. Yeah, you're welcome. I probably went on and on oh, no worries. much too long here. But no worries. So I'm just going to talk. I'm going to be boots on the ground today and just uh, show a whole bunch of examples of things you can light with the ferro rod. Um, the question we often get asked, you know, people come up with two or three things they can light in the bush, but it's nice to have a, a, myriad, a myriad of things. Uh, on the board behind me here, I've got um, just a, a list, just a quick brainstorm on some things that that you can uh, use, and then I've got a whole bunch of samples. So just randomly, I'll just start wherever, however. Something uh, available most times a year, good old grass. The, the leafier the better, and the way we process it is the way we process a lot of our tenders. We just shred it up into nice, fine shards. And for fun, I'll light some of the stuff as we go and demonstrate some of the different techniques that, for using your ferro rod. So some of the issues with using your ferro rod are, um, oops, piece of fat some of the issues with using a ferro rod is uh, uh, when people people need to understand that it's uh, it's uh, pressure that creates the hot sparks. If if you're not getting hot enough sparks, it's likely likely because you're not creating enough pressure. It's not all about speed. Um, so to create that pressure, there's a whole bunch of different techniques. I mean, when you when you get them out of the box, of course they, they show throwing a spark this way. But uh, a, a simple trick is to hold the knife still and pull the uh, and instead move the ferro rod. It tends to put your sparks right where you want them. So lots of techniques to uh, to uh, generate that pressure that's required for your sparks. So those those are some simple techniques. Simple techniques. Um, as we move through some of the different materials, I'll show some different ways to throw uh, variations uh, in the sparks. So uh, that's one grass. The next one we're going to do is uh, some of our uh, stuff that we're familiar with is things like. Uh, cotton balls coated with, like Morris said, Vicks Vapor Rub or petroleum jelly or Vaseline. They're kind of half waterproof in cubes. Pull them apart. Extraordinarily flammable. There's a million of those on YouTube, so I'm not going to do that. It's very, very reliable fire starter. Uh, some people are, are, are uh, infatuated with bringing uh, dryer lint and either putting it in a waterproof container or treating it with paraffin and different things. And I just want to remind people that uh, you're actually usually carrying some with you if you've got the right kind of clothing on. So in this case, it's a pair of denim jeans. And we can simply just off your pant leg, make sure to leave some clothes on your back. Don't shred it all into lint, but that, that lights very readily. So uh, here's another technique. I'll do a whole bunch. So here's another one for uh, when you can uh, afford the luxury of uh, bedding your uh, ferro rod right on something solid. Of course, now you can apply a lot of sparks. So the bigger a pile of lint that I make, the more, the longer my fire will last, of course. Uh, inner barks of trees. <clears throat> We've got uh, both our species of poplar here in this ecology, our aspen and our balsam poplar, and some of our species of willow at the right time of year, you can uh, process the inner bark into this gorgeously uh, lofty bird's nest, which we can light directly with a ferro or we can use, we can take an ember and blow it into flame. So I'm going to reserve this. I don't, you don't need to see me light this. I'm going to reserve this for when we use our ferrule sometimes to create an ember. Sometimes we can't find anything flammable, but we can find things that we can uh, create an ember with. So we'll come back to that. Here's a piece of the bark and what it looks like. This is how we collect. This is bush gold. It's both fusible and flammable. So it's, uh, even if you're waist deep in snow and wandering around, you can find a uh, usually a standing tree. Some of these tinders, important to note that um, examples being grass, inner bark, old man's beard, they sometimes will be damp when you collect them because they're under the bark or maybe the grass is sticking out of the snow or maybe the old man's beard, um, the humidity in the air is such that it's not very flammable. So uh, putting it in your front pocket or between your first and second layers near your abdomen, in a matter of hours it becomes uh, quite dry to the touch. And, and flammable, so so even even if it's wet and you find it in the bush, you have the resource to dry it out in a very short amount of time. If you make light, airy bundles out of it, and then uh, again pocket 
or first and second layers. So in a couple of minutes we've already done a, a myriad of things. Another man-made one here, steel wool. Lights with batteries, everybody's seen those uh, parlor tricks, and uh, but it lights very well with, uh, of course, with a ferrous ferrum too, so. Either as an ember into a tinder bundle, or if I keep fanning that or spread this out, it'll I can make it burst into flames. Intense heat that'll light lots of things. Wasp nest, great thing to happen on fairly often in the bush. Put a little in your pocket when you find it. That lights very well too. <laughs> Persistent. Whoa. <laughs> Wasp nest is next to high quality cotton for making tinder. Yes, next to more said if you heard that next to high quality cotton for tinder. Um, fat wood, this is some commercial stuff from the store. This is some found locally. So it's um, wood that has died and then to repair itself it's injected resin. And if you can see the stripes of resin wood, resin wood, resin wood. So it makes a uh, sort of a very uh, flammable uh, mixture. It's, it's heavy. And it, Smells like turpentine, and uh, we make something, well, I, I call it wood wool, I don't know if that's the right term for it or not, but essentially we take the back of our knife, dry that off. Fell in the snow a second ago, but it probably is not gonna hurt anything because the, the resin sort of makes it waterproof. When you're using this technique, put it on, so it's kind of gummy, like I can actually push it together and it sort of sticks, so I make a pile about the size of a quarter. You can have this sitting on a flat piece of wood or a piece of bark. Maybe I'll actually do that, just so that you can manage it. So now I've got a match. I can carry this around and light my fire. So here's a here's another technique. I'm going to put my knife this way, and I'm going to draw the draw the fair same across the back of the knife. And the advantage to this is I can be very specific about where my sparks end up. Oops. <laughs> it's just like a magic trick. <laughs> the uh, the uh, bark went right up from underneath the... How's that possible? Let's see like the tablecloth and the dishes thing. They must have told a lie. <laughs> Looks very readily and it's very robust. So it's gold. Now you can actually, you can make wood wool. It doesn't have to have to have to be fat wood. It can also be just, uh, it can just be any wood as long as it's uh, seasoned and it lends itself to making that same wool. It's just fat wood is superior because it's uh, it's full of resin. Yeah, too, if you cut your wood at a good angle onto the, like the annual rings instead of trying to scrape annual rings, but sort of, you know, cut uh, that often improves the scraping. So the, uh, so perpendicular to the annual rings or? No, or no, uh, you know, annual rings there might be just uh, how you split out. Right. But if you purposely cut them at a bit of a slope, so you're scraping off the slope. So shearing sort of the you'll, slope, yeah. You'll often get uh, more, you know, more predictable curlies. We were always quite partial to use our axe handles for that because the wood is so hard in axe handles that, you know, so you, you, know, you found that, well, if you bring your axe with you anyway, you know. Quite as uh, doesn't burn quite as long or as quite as well as the fat well, wood, but uh, not, you, not, not bad. If your pile was three times as big, it would yeah <laughs> it would flare up with you'd have to leap back. Yeah. Okay, uh, resin from our trees, especially striated with bark, you'll find that if you if you pummel it and make it into a powder, it won't light directly with a spark, or it might with a lot of work. But if you actually just break some chunks off and you just pummel it into a powder. Yeah, the resin or rosin. The resin that has been refined is often called rosin. 
uh, it has to, it's like candle wax, it has to have a wick. Right. So you're always keeping your mind if you've got stuff that mixed in there that will, uh, will act as a wick because the pure stuff sometimes doesn't ignite until it's bubbling. You need some heat but to it. But if you've got particles of bark or shavings or something in there, Once that ignites, it tends to be fairly robust. Often persistence with a sparker because you're pre-charring material ahead of yourself. So you're creating an environment that maybe if it won't light at first, a little bit of persistence. When you're using this technique, be cognizant of um, your edge because those sparks are hot enough to ruin the temper on your fine edge. So that's, that's the disadvantage of using a spark in this fashion. Sometimes uh, different techniques, if you have something that um, is uh, uh, being, uh, you know, this not uh, lighting as fast as you'd like it to. Of course, you can do some slow strokes. So if you slow, stroke slow enough on your ferrocerium and carefully do it without making any sparks, which is the day you want to do that. Yeah, and we a, actually. <laughs> there's a technique where you use your knuckles. And so as you scrape down, your knuckles keep the knife from flattening your kindling. And, uh, well, just as a stopper. Yeah. yeah. Well, right, right, right. So when I make a little pile of shavings, then yeah, they and enter. Then ignite them. Yes. Then you get. So that's it's like using your rod for your source of magnesium. Right. <laughs> and then another technique for lighting stubborn fuels is sometimes it's not the big robust sparks, but showers of sparks and repetition that all of a sudden catch your item on fire. There's something about sort of preheating the fuels. I'm just going to get a little more powder. As you can see, everything doesn't work 100% on every day. It's, that's why you need to have so many tinders, or kindlings in this case. Okay, you don't have your, your, your back your edge, your knife isn't squared enough. There is other options too. You can uh, make a, not a bad spark with a, with a rock. Two in a pinch. Not quite as good as a knife. It works a lot better with that method than with you moving the rock, holding the rock steady. Yeah. yeah. You live and learn. Good grief. I thought, I, thought, I thought I knew everything that was to know about <laughs> all these things. <laughs> you know, all of it plus some more and then forgot some and then uh, us bums come in behind and add some easy stuff. Um, hand sanitizer. So the issue with hand sanitizer is it's a very reliable fire starter, but if, you, if you're thinking you can use it in cold temperatures, it needs, of course, to be off-gassing if it's going to ignite. Um, but it lights, uh, lights gorgeously, of course, because it's, after all, 90% alcohol. So well, another thing usually that, makes a, a flame that's... Uh, a nubble, another yeah, double... Good thing is that certain glues that come in tubes, <laughs> uh, especially, you know. Oh, like and they're very that. flammable. They're like uh, paste. The glue thing. is both flammable enough to use it as igniter, and <laughs> you've brought a glue to repair <laughs> your broken paddle handles and so on. So you can't see the flame, but you can see the bark. You can see the bark burning, so you know it's on fire. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you can buy this stuff, too. Fire paste. Ah. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I think probably Camper's Village. Area, but I, that's an instructor's. You don't bring that up in <laughs> presence of students. Because <laughs> that's your. So what I, what I would do is to um, uh, give the illusion that I'm invincible, as I'd put <laughs> that paste in a Ziploc bag, little bag, and then when I'm off trying to demonstrate to uh, students how well I can light a fire, I uh, they don't see me tear the corner out of the Ziploc bag. Right. And then squirt that into my bundle, <laughs> and then all I have to do is just bring a flame near there, and it bursts into flame. They don't know that. So oh, that's funny. I'm giving away secrets. So if you did have to get this to off gas in colder temperatures, obviously you're gonna have to put it in your pocket, and hopefully, I always say if I thought if I put enough in my buddy's hand and it would stay warm enough, it would probably off gas, and I could light it there. <laughs> light uh, a little fire to warm that stuff up first, and then light it. Shredded, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Make a favorite. Shredded, fine shredded birch bark, not too coarse. 
lights off fairly well with the ferrule. Um, a trick with birch bark is uh, the really nice fine shardy stuff here. That's your that's your pay dirt as far as uh, lighting. That stuff lights very readily. And if it if it's not in an abundance, even on some coarser bark, um, you can you can scrape. There's and you'll a, find this little wispy. In, in the literature, they say that some of that really fine stuff that's scraped out there, that actually the flint and steel off of a, Whoa. you know, the rock carbon and steel and wow. rock is wow. up like that. But I've never managed to, we, yeah. I can't remember where I never got around to trying it, or I tried it and never succeeded. We'll, we'll, have, to, but, we'll have to try it next next yeah. course, yeah. But again, so these little fine, and you sometimes on a tree, you can just take your hands and rub up and down and have somebody catch the snow that falls and it just is the beautiful little, the finest of fine, uh, this is the stuff you're after here. It's thinner than onion skin. Onion skin? Actual onion skin? Yeah, thinner than, yeah, thinner than onion skin. <laughs> well, uh, Salt Peter used to play a role. I don't know how you extract that from the natural environment. I think you can get it from bird manure. So if you raise chickens and you know how to do it, you can get saltpeter. And uh, but you can buy it. It's it's a constituent of uh, curing hams and things. And I was just flabbergasted uh, not that long ago going to a drugstore, and there I see saltpeter for sale on uh, on uh, the shelf in a drugstore. And I read it, and it says, "Oh, you know, part of the recipe for curing hams and so on." Well, in my day, you wouldn't sell it directly because everybody would buy the stuff and try to make explosives, gunpowder and everything. <laughs> anyway, I had some on hand and this visiting student, he he heard about saltpeter being used, so we boiled uh, a false tender fungus with saltpeter. Well, he came from Scotland and he said, no, I can't take this on the plane. I probably would go to jail. They found me carrying something as touchable as a uh, false tender fungus that's been soaked in saltpeter solution. <laughs> It, it just, it almost uh, leaped out and caught the, <laughs> the uh, yeah. just the slightest uh, tiny little spark would ignite it. Uh, Impressive, eh? Candle wick, so you shave back some of the wax and you, you fray it a bit. Oh, I usually cut a groove in the, in the uh, candle and hold it in such a way that I can scrape towards it oh, on oh. the rod. You've never seen me do that? No, I haven't. I just I didn't, never thought it was, never been that sophisticated, of course. I, I'd go. always start practicing a few days before I'd go to the trade show in Red Deer. Oh, it was going, the wind snuffed it out. Yeah. yeah. And a charred candle wick catches more readily than... Uh, yeah, once you... Oh, well, that's, uh, that's, that's great that you got it so readily. Mm, the technique I use where I tie a groove so I can have it and then I scrape towards it. It's pretty okay. challenging. That, that's much faster. Um, what else we got? Old man's beard, of course. So, you're both the world's worst fire starter and the world's best fire starter a day apart. If it's in the rain or high humidity or in the hot sun, when you don't need a fire, it's great. But it dries really quickly yeah. and lights very readily. When you need something like that, at, at, at uh, you need it the most, it's at its worst. So. You got to keep that in mind. You don't don't just sort of uh, assume that everything acts in the same way. This could be a little damp still, but in the pocket for a couple hours, and that would be. There it goes. The wind is always at the same time your worst enemy and your best friend. Sometimes it's a hindrance. And sometimes it's. In this case, it's thought to be helping me. There we go. A little bit of pers perseverance on some of this stuff sometimes. Um, different types of funguses. So there's um, the techniques. Well, first I'll go um, fine, fine shavings. So no rocket science here. Just a sharp knife, and if your knife isn't squared to make wood, we'll. Just making them just gorgeous little shavings. In some cases, fine twigs when you've got your skill with your ferrocerium done. There's a story out there called the hatchet. 
where uh, a young lad is um, in an airplane that crashes and I guess he's the only survivor, the pilot perishes and uh, he manages to retrieve some of the gear on the airplane and no matches and at some point he gets very frustrated and he throws his hatchet and it hits Bank. a rock and a spark <laughs> comes off and from that he teaches himself how to use that spark off the hatchet to light a fire. <laughs> That's funny. No way, no way. <laughs> if you figure that a normal human without some background experience can extrapolate from themselves something <laughs> as complex, lighting fire with a flint and steel, it's, you know, and there's thousands of kids that read that story because it almost seems like it's required reading in our educational system. But, uh, pushing the fiction too far. Cat you got tail. the down? From cat a, tail flap, yeah. Uh, what, from what? A uh, cat, cat tail flap. Oh, cat tail flap. So extraordinarily flammable. Yeah, the native people in the Arctic, they use the down from, uh, you know, the, 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 what is it, that, the, the geese or, or ducks. Oh, birds, like uh, 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 eider down? No. Eider, yeah. Oh. The eider duck down, they mixed it with the kindling to make oh. it. With, uh, yeah. <laughs> Smell the bird there. And they, and <laughs> There's they, it. They would hammer two pieces of pyrite together to get their spark, and they found that mixing in some of that eider down made a big difference in it catching. So this stuff is extraordinarily flammable, but it only lasts this long. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. And you're done. Well, oh, actually it's hanging in there pretty good. If you got, if you got uh, heavier stuff, now probably if you had a bit of uh, grass or a bit of the Yes, other. exactly what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna do that same thing. Now we're gonna striate it. Uh, cattail down is, it's a little bit flammable, but it's more of a fuser. It's added to bundles to uh, fuse your ember and help it grow. So we're gonna shred yeah. a whole bunch of. Yeah, there's certain fine kindlings that the fluff holds it together and, uh, and helps it get ignited, yeah. How about some little fine shavings? So what we're going to do this, different this time is we're going to ignite the fluff. But as long as we keep agitating that fluff, it'll keep burning. So now I've got, if, even if my sparking system isn't that great. Um, yeah, the, the, the native people in... Uh, as long as I keep agitating it, it'll keep yeah, burning and keep burning. So eventually... The the yeah. Stuff on yeah, and invariably some of the birch bark. It looks like you're stir frying. Yeah, <laughs> as long as you keep exposing new areas. And then eventually, whoa, we got a flame there. Eventually, it doesn't go out. That's yeah. Right. yeah, exactly. And you've got something on the table over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got lots of flammables. <clears throat> when, uh, when you know what you're doing, next thing you become a hazard. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> you no matter it. what you do, you can't get a fire going. <laughs> um, feather stick. So, it's a, we use that as sort of the acid test of a feather stick. If you can make nice, fine uh, fork, at least four curl feather sticks, they're so fine that um, you can light them with your ferro rod. That's that's a good test. And then I have a nice match here too. Uh, so at the, the way we finish off our uh, feather stick is to make some very, 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 very fine shavings. And if they're fine enough, they'll catch fairly readily. And then I'll have a nice, uh, nice flame. So this is a good example of where this technique lends itself very well. Yeah. All these years I've known you and I didn't know you knew this, this technique and I didn't know. So, uh, uh, we'll play around. It's obviously, uh, obviously a lot more uh, effective than trying to press the rod in the center of the uh, yeah 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 that and then getting it going yes that that what you're doing there is probably like probably the most serious reason why you're carrying a knife the uh, that's the fire lighting is the ability to make, make the noise. shavings that'll help you light that fire fireweed fluff same as the yeah, cat tail yeah. fluff. you can find a stick uh, I learned from the Swedes that that um, um, if you find a stick that's, oh, I don't know, thumb thick, then no matter how much it's raining, you can shave off the outer layers, and uh, by shaving out one, the interior of it is dry enough to work. And so it means that uh, you get a stick that's been rained on for three days, 
shave off that outer layer, make the shavings, and away you go without trying to find all these other exotic things. So your repertoire of, uh, of uh, uh, yeah, a lot of things, if you compress them too much, they don't work, and if you don't compress them enough, if they're too fluffy, they don't work so well, and if they're uh, uh, not fluffed up enough. So I, that's the secret in, in uh, Have you have you lit uh, pine needles with the? Uh, I would suspect. Randy that. Randy has uh, the uh, red the red <laughs> yeah, needles when they're red. Pine needles uh, when they're red, they're they're resin impregnated and on and on. They're also, uh, but everything uh, has to be worked with in training. You can't work it out on your own without. Uh, you know you don't have enough time. Uh, in a survival episode to teach yourself a lot of this stuff. It's got to be sort of experimented with and mastered under training. This in a bigger bundle would, of course, hit critical mass and burst into flame. Yeah. There are a lot of things that I find the finest twigs that you can get out of the spruce. And, uh, uh, you know, they're uh, small, you know, they're thinner than matchsticks. And if you mix that fluff with twigs like that, and then you blow in the fluff, those little twigs catch on fire. Oh, right. So it's almost the same and principle the, as the cattail fluff. Yeah, just like the cattail, the, uh, right. the uh, uh, a mixture of two things and you've got success. Yes, yes. You yeah, can't catalyst. ignite the twigs as readily and you can't ignite the fluff, but well, yeah, when you mix the two, all of a sudden you get a... Uh, so in this instance, what I'm doing, I'm not actually trying for flame because it made flame for a second, but it won't persist. I'm using punk wood to generate an ember, which in turn I'll transfer into a tinder bundle. Yeah. This type of ember, it requires almost constant fanning <laughs> or it goes out. So that's yeah. one ember. I'll do a few embers and then I'll actually light a fire with an ember. So there's a rotten wood. We yeah. have a selection of funguses. This is a uh, tinder fungus or a chaga. This is a good example where you can... The tiniest spark ignites that stuff. It's... Uh, we'll probably use that one to make our fire. Um, yeah. This is the... Uh, so this is what the chaga looks like growing on a birch. You can see it's busting out, looks charred. The back it's is... It's actually... Uh, the, the oxygen in the air is slowly turning the surface of the chaga into carbon. Ah. It's an extremely slow form of oxidization, <laughs> indicating how exquisitely oxidizable it is. That uh, just the oxygen eventually changes the, uh, chars the stuff cool. on the outside. Corky substance on the back. Yeah, if, it's, if it's a consistency of, of um, of, of cork, then you know that that is going to probably turn out to be superior. I've I've seen stuff there that even a, a, a big lighter won't light. <laughs> no, all right, just to get, get into it until you crumble it into a dust. This is the false tender fungus with the uh, hard shell on and with the hard shell removed. Underneath the hard shell, there's this gorgeous soft uh, uh, context that chamois cloth was actually made out of originally. There's a whole bunch of uses, um, but it's, this also lends itself to catching a spark too and creating a number. Yeah, there's various recipes. Some places it seems to improve the catchability just by boiling it. And in some articles would say use the ashes, the white ash from the campfire, and make kind of a soup out of that and then boil that and then when you dry it, it'll catch a spark. We've played around with all of those things. They all seem to work if one thing doesn't work. So I can cut that off now. I've got another ember. So when you ignite that that edge, then put it out, then the flint and steel ignites this very readily. Right. So you don't Let's have to char. have a complex tinder box. You don't have to do this, do that. Because we find that by charring those little pieces, when you do have a fire, is going to be sufficient to uh, pull, you know reignite all of that.
so lesson here is just nothing other than sometimes your pharaoh you can't get something to flame, but you can get something to uh, to create an ember, and then have a hope of maybe drying this out if it wasn't if this was damp to the point when, that you wouldn't light directly. When you're wandering around in the boreal forest, it's very often to see a squirrel's nest up. You got a long pole and you can dislodge a squirrel nest. It's often full of. <laughs> it's ready to rock and roll. The, the, the squirrel builds it in such a way that the heart of the nest is still dry and all the stuff that that squirrel has shredded is <laughs> the, very the, readily the, used as a, a fine kindling, as a, as a you know, a, a superior kindling. There's a flying squirrel that resides in the shed and he makes us our tinder bundle material all the time with grass and newspaper and and shredded bark and dried mushrooms and uh, I guess uh, uh, the, uh watch your knee there and, uh, the uh, hey, I get to reuse my uh, lucky I was watching you yeah they uh, would have burnt my dollar my uh, <laughs> salvation army pants yeah. the, <laughs> Thanks, uh, maybe there's a connection between how insulative the material is and how so the, something that's both highly insulated is also highly, highly ignitable, <laughs> because it's fluffy and fine. And for the last one, let's do one more. Let's do, um, I had some fine twigs here someplace. Then meticulously saved and then uh, brushed off the table. You see some fine twigs here. Save the best for last, and uh, hmm. oh, they're all uh, scattered here. Oh, I see. Well, this will be a good test. I've knocked them onto the ground in the snow. So we're going to take the finest of twigs. And this is following through on what Morris said about the the flammability of the, uh, the sap from a from a fir. So I'm going to take these little twigs and I'm going to pop a blister and I'm just going to butter butter them up. So these twigs in perfect conditions you might get to light with a ferrule. But if we just literally butter them up with uh, some balsam sap, they become extremely easy to light. With the ferrule. Ignitable volatile principles in that stuff. Have you ever uh, used uh, orange peel and, uh, you know, uh, fold the orange peel in, in a match? In the, yeah, it's quite striking, yeah. That's also one good way to uh, discipline your cat. Doing <laughs> things. And uh, I, I, you can actually collect that by, you know, if you take a, you know, like a piece of foil, you can do that until you can fill a little bottle full of that juice. That, uh, that's so volatile in orange peels. It should be enough. We'll it's see. Almost, if not, uh, we'll add a little bit. It's, it's almost magical in the way it operates. Makes a little robust, extra robust flame because of the sap on there. So a lot of things you can butter up with uh, uh, either melted resin, I suppose, or but definitely resin from a fir tree. You can easily start your fire. Well, that's probably enough things. I give people a dozen or so more things at least that they can light. Your uh, your uh, false tinder fungus there is burning. That's uh, what was that? Oh, I thought oh, it was beyond. I thought it was burning. That's uh, also a medium for carrying fire. You right. light a bit of it, and it may glow for hours. Right. right. As you go from A to B, uh, you might like to have something that that's a tremendous resource. The things. Next to cattail, birch must provide more interesting stuff than almost anything else in the forest. But cattail is still the king. So just the quick list here, grass, dry old man's beard, fine shavings or wood wool, fat wood. Some of these we played with today, fungus, uh, both the tinder fungus and false tinder fungus. Uh, dryer lint or lint off your pant leg, feather sticks, candle wick, balsam sap on twigs, Pulverized resin and bark, we did that one. Birch bark, oh, we did quite a few. Cattail fluff, we did. Striated with flammables. Thistle fluff, punk wood, we did that. Oh, fire dogs, yeah. <laughs> so uh, sometimes in an old campfire, you pull the end, the end of the firewood out of the, uh, 
fire, <laughs> and if it hasn't been too long, you can actually hit that with a ferrule and start it aglow and use the ember technique to uh, blow something into flame. Thistle fluff, uh, punk wood, we saw that, fired dogs, I talked about that. Sheet of plain paper or wax paper, which more has demonstrated. Tissue out of your uh, pocket. Hand sanitizer, we talked about that. Vaseline and cotton balls. Inner bark of poplar willow and, uh, and uh, our, uh, yeah, poplars and our willow. And then outer bark of stinging nettle, uh, fireweed, thistle. Those are things we pick on for cordage. And a lot of, and even some natural cordages too. If you fray them, sometimes they'll ignite with a ferrule. The shrubby sink foil, it sheds its bark. We can make tinder bundles that they will ignite either with an ember or with a ferrule rod. And our honeysuckles have exfoliating bark that we can gather up and use uh, to start fires too. Steel wool, we saw that, wasp nests. Oh, we did pretty damn good today. <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, <laughs> you're, you haven't got your splints dipped in sulfur on there, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Morris by accident lit the uh, ground on fire and realized that if uh, humus or peat is sort of at the right stage of powder, it'll actually uh, catch a spark and start a glow. So at the right stage, even something as simply, simple as the uh, <laughs> the ground. <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned, uh, if you have the time to experiment, almost probably any fungus, you know, like the squirrels, they gather the fungus. See, see if you can grind it into a dust and see if it'll work, because very often I was led to believe and I, you know, life is so short. I've been told this about five years ago, and I yet, yet uh, verify it. This person claimed that that the likelihood of taking any type of fungus that, if it's dry enough, and you grind it into a powder, without having to have a fire to carbonize it, it may surprisingly spark, work. Yeah. It'll oh, catch a spark. Next, next course. Because the nature of the tissues, I guess, in mushrooms, lends itself that ground that you create a Just such a dust yeah, that, yeah. that uh, might catch. Then there, then there is other methods of lighting fire. Of course, we got the uh, par, you know parabolic reflectors, but you know the Egyptians knew two ways of lighting a fire: one with a bow drill, the other was uh, just heap up a whole pile of weeds and everything in a in the right way, and next thing you know, it's glowing <laughs> through uh, spontaneous combustion. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that often. Uh, have you ever seen people bale hay? At the wrong time, and then you drive by, and that bale is smoking. Smoking, smoldering, yeah. yeah. The bale is so wet, but interior it's hot enough to yeah. actually S silage. Smoke. Silage quite often yeah, starts yeah, on fire. I yeah, get that. Well, that, <laughs> that heat that's generated if you pile up your stuff in the right way. Um, uh, linseed you know, rags, cotton rags soaked in linseed. I've seen them, you know, make a pile of that, in, in, and that's a particular hazard to burn your house down. Mm -hmm. Uh, or students would wipe down all the woodwork on their canoes and canoe paddles with boiled linseed oil and they use the towels from the, you know, where they lend you the towels and when the towels start to disintegrate, then they just don't throw them away, they use them as rags. We use tiles like that that have been laundered countless times and if you saturate them with uh, boiled linseed oil and you make the pile big enough, Randomly is going to be some combination uh, that's going to spontaneously yeah, combust. Uh, <laughs> we left the, the the outdoor equipment room, and the students threw all the pile on the pile because they were you know you were say metal container or something, and uh, we were then uh, directly from the lunch going to a meeting, and I had some reason to go to the equipment room, and when I opened the door, the dense smoke it was sort of like it was really ready thick. Ready to explode. <laughs> and I knew I could smell it was linseed oil, and I knew right away. That and then I took a shovel and I got like this. It was probably about, you know, a couple gallons worth of, of saturated rags, yeah. and I threw it outside and saved the the the, uh, the, the, the east building. <laughs> east edge of the butter dome from going up in flames. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Phyllis. So thanks for uh, visiting uh, the Caramat YouTube site, and uh, yeah, please uh, hit the like button and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, tell your friends. Hopefully, uh, people watching this have learned something. <laughs> I did, <laughs> so did I. and I'm an old dog at this. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right.